You know, people love talking about themselves. If you hop on a 30 minute call with them and in, you know, two, three months or in a year, you're like, hey, I applied to a job or hey, let's get lunch. Like one conversation can lead to them recommending you for a job because they know who you are as a person before wanting to be in the sports industry. This is the Work in Sports Podcast. In April 2018, New England Patriots head coach Bill Belichick joined up with Urban Meyer, who at the time was Ohio State's head coach as part of an off-season coaching clinic. These are two pillars of the coaching fraternity, the top dog in the NFL, the top dog in college football. And they met up and started discussing their strategy on team building. Urban Meyer was really impressed with Bill Belichick's ability to take borderline players, average players, and develop them into almost stars. Sure, he had Tom Brady and he had Gronk. But other than that, this was a team of slightly above average players who he raised to a new level. And Urban Meyer inquired with him and said, how do you do it? How do you develop a team to grow this way that isn't as star-studded, but you get them to perform so well as a team? Bill Belichick's answer has resonated with me ever since. He said, at this point in my career, I want to coach guys that I like. I'm not going to coach anybody else. This is the skill that so many job seekers forget. Yes, we are a skills-based hiring world. You need to have something tangible in your resume in order to be noticed and get into that interview cycle. But you also have to be likable. You have to convey energy, enthusiasm, and be enjoyable to be around. This is the secret sauce. If you combine skills that match the marketplace with an attitude and charisma and likability, you become unstoppable. Today's guest is that Venn diagram overlap. Alana Moraz is the International Partnership Activation Coordinator for Major League Baseball and the founder of Latinx in Sports. But my favorite part is her energy infectious personality, and magnetism. Because buckle up, she's got a lot of great ideas and advice ready to share. And she's got likability just flowing out of her. Here's Alana. Want to land more job interviews? Use Work in Sports' iScore tool to see how your resume compares to a specific sports job and get instant recommendations on how to improve it. When your resume matches the requirements of a job, you're going to be in demand. Only available on workingsports.com. Hi, Alana. How are you? Thanks so much for jumping on the show with me. This is fun to have this conversation with you today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be on the show. These are fun conversations, as you and I were talking about beforehand. We're trying to help young people get their direction in the industry and figure a lot of things out. And since you are pretty new into your career as well, I think you have a lot of recency knowledge. You have a lot of experiences that people can really relate to, which makes this a fun conversation. So let's start out here. Most of the people, and I've done a lot of these interviews, I see this pattern a lot. The people that are the most successful in our industry did a lot of internships in college. They got a lot of different experiences out there. And that really fits for you. I counted in your bio five different internships you did while at Arizona State University. What do you remember most about those experiences and how do you feel like it set you up for where you are now? Yeah, uh, I definitely, I was fortunate enough to be, uh, to have a lot of different opportunities while Arizona State. A lot of them were focused around game presentation, operations. That was something that I was very keen to and really interested in when I was kind of just trying to find my experience and my foot in the door. I started my career really in the sports industry at Phoenix Rising, which is the USL team in Phoenix, Arizona. I was the community relations intern but our team was so small just being on the minor league side and it had just rebranded to Phoenix Rising from, I believe, Arizona FC that I got yeah. so much experience just even outside of community relations. I was doing operations, game presentation, marketing, helping with social media on top of also community relations. Um, so I think I was put in a very fortunate spot to see what I liked and what I didn't like. And coming out of that internship, I really did see that game presentation, like putting together the halftime where there's like little kids playing soccer or in the middle of a larger yeah. soccer game or the walkout kids and all those different things was something that I really enjoyed and I wanted to see what went into it. Um, and then I was able to join the Arizona Diamondbacks in their game presentation department. So I grew up a lifelong Arizona Diamondbacks fan ever since they started in, I believe it was 97. I was born in 96, so very short after. Um, and I was able to spend the whole entire home season there, all 82 games. And it was honestly a dream. And it was so cool to be able to give back a positive fan experience and like overall game presentation experience that like I was able to experience as a fan growing up and attending these games as a fan. So it was a really great time. Yeah, I like how it kind of, you, you started broad with getting a lot of different types of ex experience. 
And then you figured out what you liked and you zeroed in on that a little bit. Was that part of the strategy going into it or just a, did that just happen organically? I think it was part of the strategy. I was at Arizona State. I was studying sports business. I was going to come into Arizona State as a sports journalism major. I realized my senior year of high school, I didn't really like journalism because I feel like at the time, we re- I personally thought that journalism was like, the athletic. It was newspapers. It was like, you know, beat writers. And looking back on it now, I think we're at a point where journalism soon turned into social media. And I wish I would have known that because I think I would have stayed with it because social media obviously is such a big component of what our industry is today. And it's something that I personally really enjoy, just even my own personal social media. But I decided to switch my career path to sports business. Obviously, I could, you know, my mom's mentality was you can use a business degree wherever you go. And if it's a sports business degree, then it's smart mom. Yes. Really smart advice. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> wherever you go, you can use a business degree or you can learn about the sports business side, which I think was something that I hadn't really ever been exposed to. So when I got my internship at Phoenix Rising, it was definitely like the, OK, I really like community relations and what it means to grow a sport, especially being soccer. I'm originally um, Mexican heritage culture. So soccer was a huge component of me of me yeah. growing up as well as baseball. So for me to be able to participate in that sport and to be able to work for them was really cool. But yeah, I mean, I think for sure it was, hey, here's this one thing I think I like. And if I don't like it, then great. We check it off the list and we move on to something else. And like I said, I wore so many different hats that then I was able to learn what hats I did enjoy and which ones I was like not so keen to. And coming out of it, it was it was game presentation operations just because I love to see what goes on behind the scenes to put together like a great game. Like I always think about it like the Super Bowl and NBA All-Star. Like, there's so yeah. many different moving parts. I was just at World Baseball Classic. And to see it behind the scenes was insane because I had gone to games as a fan and had enjoyed it as well. So now to see what goes on, um, you know, behind the doors were was super cool. So before we go any further, I'm just going to tell you right now, I love your enthusiasm. I love your energy. I'm feeling it. I think it's great. And I try to tell people all the time, we're working in sports. We should be enjoying this. We should be having fun and like enthused and energetic by this. And I think that has to come through in your attitude when you're applying for jobs and you're interviewing and whatever, like being excited and happy is good. Like why are, I don't think people should restrain themselves from that. And I love that you're bringing that so far in this conversation today. So thank you. I appreciate that. I think, you know, it's uh, a quote that we hear everywhere, but it's like, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life, which Definitely working in the sports industry. It is long hours and weekends and holidays. It's still work, yeah. It's 100% work. But, you know, enjoying what I do and enjoying the sport around me. Like I said, I was at World Baseball Classic. We had doubleheader games. I was watching two baseball games a day. It was like a dream. I was like, I love this. I am definitely yeah. still working. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm watching a baseball game and having my computer out and I'm taking meetings. But at the end of the day, like... I really do enjoy it and I enjoy what I do here and, you know, at my previous stops in my career. So it's definitely the enthusiasm is there and being excited about getting to go to work every day. Well, we're going to talk a lot about World Baseball Classic. We're going to talk about Major League Baseball and all the things that you're experiencing right now with Latinx and sports and all that. So I want to hear a lot, but I just I want to go back for a little bit still in in your buildup. So you graduated from ASU at a really tough time in 2019. The world was in a weird place. We all know it. We don't need to relive it, but that's a tough time to graduate and get out there. But you eventually got hired by U.S. Soccer Federation as a fan experience coordinator. How big of a relief was that? And and what was that initial opportunity like for you? Yeah, I think it was a huge weight lifted off my shoulder. So once I graduated in 2019 from Arizona State, I went to Spain, uh, to Barcelona to go to grad school. I was there from October of 2019 to March of 2020, came home, uh, didn't know what I wanted to do. Again, I was very into game operations, events. At that time, leagues had either completely halted, were playing in a bubble behind closed doors, you know, didn't need event right. staff or operations staff. Not, not a lot of it, fan engagement. Yeah, yeah. Not, not a lot of it. So I was I was definitely like, I mean, I was freaking out. I was like, this is something that yeah. I put, like me, you know, like you said, five internships into, and this was something that I knew that I wanted to do. And then all of a sudden it just, it wasn't possible really at the time. Um, so being able to join us soccer, I was super excited. Like you said, a sport that I know I knew and I loved. Um, but yeah, it was a huge relief off my shoulders as fan experience coordinator. I was there for almost a year and a half. I was, I got to be part of the games post pandemic. Um, so we went to Houston for two games and then opened up Q2 with the U S women's national team. So it was really awesome to see it. And I, like you said, you know, the world was still in a weird place, but to be able to welcome back fans and see the players take the field and play some sort of part in that was something that was really exciting for me. So explain it to us. So fan experience coordinator, 
What does it mean? What did it mean in your world? What were those day-to-day expectations? What was game day like for you? Were you on the road traveling? Like, kind of give us the picture because you think you know what it is, but you, you're like, well, what does that really mean? Like, breaking that down for us and giving us what your experience was like, I think that's really eye-opening for a lot of people. Yeah, so I started in May of 20. 20- 21. I can't remember now. May of 2021. Yeah, time's all relative <laughs> at this point. Who knows? Exactly. Uh, so I was there. Um, like I said, I was part of the post-pandemic games, but really my day-to-day, we have a, I call it like our season ticket holder program, but not really because we don't have a home venue, but I was part of the insiders uh, membership team. So what that meant was writing like email copy, doing hospitality at all the different games that we went to domestically. I w- ended up having 29 caps um, by the time that I left. So I was part of- <laughs> oh, I like that. You got your own, <laughs> you your own stats. I yeah. like I had 29 caps. I did all of the men's World Cup qualifying cycle in the States, a lot of the women's friendlies, men's friendlies, a gold cup match. Um, So really just a lot of different things all together. But really my day to day was to make sure that the fans felt like there was someone on the other side that was like listening to them and engaging with them and cared about what was going on and what their opinions were. I was a lot I was in this hospitality that we had pregame with all these insiders and by you know, my fifth, sixth game, they like recognize me because there's so many fans that also follow whether it's the men's team or the women's team or they follow both. So like they've gone. I mean, I knew people that had like 300 caps, like 400 caps. And I mean, yeah. if they see you and they recognize you, you know, it was nice to see like a face to the team and knowing that someone was there to represent our federation and be the front facing for the fans was really exciting. And especially, you know, our insiders program, it is like a paid membership fee. So you're giving us your money to, you know, back the team and to do all these different games and all these different events. So you want to be able to also know that there's someone on the other side. Um, So that was really what my day to day was. We were based in Chicago. So I was there part of the time. I was on the road a lot. Like I said, 29 games. Um, My last couple months in June, I we went to four different games in four different cities. I mean, it was like insane Uh, for the men's and the women's team. So it was like not even the same team. We were doing both of the teams at the same time, which was something that was also really unique. I think a lot of times when people hear what my job used to be, they're like, oh, men's or women's. And I'm like, oh, it was both. I'm like, I, I all of literally, it. Yeah, yeah, both and. Yeah, yeah, it was all of it. Um, But it was yeah. it was such a great time just to be there and to see the men qualify, the women qualify down in Mexico. Soon we'll be going over to Australia and New Zealand, which is so exciting. Um, I'm still, yeah. you know, friends with a lot of my coworkers over there. They just played in Arizona, USA, Mexico for the men, which was super cool. I, you know, just being able to talk to them and still learn a lot about what they're doing. But yeah, that was kind of my my day to day. Seven months ago, you started with Major League Baseball, and now you're an international partnership activation coordinator. Take us through that a little bit, especially that international component that you bring into it here. What does that mean to work in international partnership activation, and what kind of led you to this position? Yeah. So in the States, we have, you know, Capital One, T-Mobile, a lot of Sage, Casamigos just joined. We have a lot of different partners here that, you know, support the league on the state side, but then everything that comes out of out of the States is what we are in charge of. So like Latin America, Australia, Europe, Asia, Canada, all come through my team. Um, so really what that means is when partners want to do different campaigns, whether it's on social media, um, banner ads that run on our website, email blasts, they do a lot of different activations within their countries. For example, I was just in Toronto last week. Um, and one of our partners out there, one of our betting partners, they did a kickoff event for the Blue Jays home opener. So we were out there meeting with them. Um, we were able to take the World Series trophy out there for them to have it at their event for their fan engagement and for their customers. So that's really something that we um, handle. So yeah, it's kind of what we do overall. I, to this day, am still learning what I'm doing as well. I Yeah, I no, that's like- <laughs> great. That's, that should be part of it. But like, um, that's a pretty big jump from fan engagement. I mean, it's a pretty big difference. Why did you look at that and say, okay, that's a, that's a role that I might be interested in go after? Yeah, I think for me, I wanted to try something different. I had never really played into the partnerships. Like I said, I was, you know, the internships and, and everything before it was very fan focused, customer service events, operations. Um, but for me, baseball has been such an incredible sport in my life. I've been a lifelong Diamondbacks fan and just really a fan of the sport overall. So for me, I knew that one day I did want to end up at MLB and it kind of felt like the right time to to make the jump. And it was something that I was really interested in. Like I obviously was traveling a lot with U.S. soccer, but able to travel internationally for my job was really exciting. We're going to Mexico City next week for the Mexico City series with the Padres and the Giants. And that's something that I never really thought I would ever be able to say that. I, oh, yeah, like I'm yeah. I'm going to London um, in June, you know, for for the London series and different things like that. And 
Also for me, I'm really proud to be Mexican and Latina and I learned Spanish before I learned English. So now to be able to use my native language that I've known my whole entire life in my job day to day is something that is a really special feeling and not a lot of people can say. So I think that was also another really interesting part was that I got to work. I get now to work with people from Latin America, from Mexico. And I think that's really something that's fulfilling for me and and a really cool perk to have. So what's that like when you travel to these events? Are you meeting with the partners and making sure they're happy with what's happening? Are you making making sure the creative gets done the way it's supposed to get done. Like, what's that role like for you when you go to a a Blue Jays or you go to Mexico or you go to London? I know you haven't done all of them yet, but what is that kind of expectation or what's your role like when you're on the ground? Yeah, I would definitely say a large part of it is meeting with partners and hosting them when they want to come out to the game or A lot of our partners also use our events and, you know, the contractual tickets that they get to send their clients or their, those run a sweepstakes and they'll come to postseason or they'll come to Mexico or London. Um, So that's a large component of it too, to make sure that not only are partners happy, but their clients and also their customers that they, you know, send over to the game. And yeah, I would say the other part for sure is a creative, the signage we get there two or three days before and we run through all the signage with our design team, make sure that everything looks correct. It's the right size. It looks good on TV. If we have video board spots or like LEDs, we run through that as well. You know, again, just kind of being their contact on the ground for whatever they may need is really, really what who we are. So you have a pretty cool side hustle. In October 2020, <laughs> you founded Latinx in Sports, uh, an organization for Latinx sports professionals as network and find community. There are a lot of people who have ideas and they never follow through on them. I, I would say that I've had lots of ideas that I've never followed through on. What drove you to make this a reality? And then tell us a little bit more about what it is and why it exists. Yeah, uh, I think for me, obviously October 2020, middle of the pandemic, we're all sitting at home. Trying yeah, to why not? Out. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're all. I, I was. I came out of grad school. I was, you know, in the. I want to do events and I want to do operations, but hey, I can't do that right now. And I was, right. you know, really just trying to network and meet different people because we were all sitting at home. So it was like very much like the time of like Zoom calls. Like, are you free? My mom used to make fun of me. I used to have like six Zoom calls a day or like phone calls yeah. a day. But really, I just wanted to like, learn about people. And I wanted to see what they did. And my mom, she is in public relations. So she was like, you know, people love talking about themselves. If you hop on a 30 minute call with them and then, you know, two, three months or in a year, you're like, hey, I applied to a job or hey, let's get lunch. Like they'll know that you authentically wanted to know them and you'll build that relationship over time. So I think that was really what was at my forefront. But mom is pretty smart. That's the other thing that's come out of this conversation. She really is. Pretty smart lady. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) She really is. But yeah, so That was really, I think, the overall framework of what Latinx and sports was. But during Hispanic Heritage Month of 2020, I really didn't see a lot of teams and leagues highlighting their Hispanic Latinx front office. And for me, being a Latina, I wanted to see the representation. And I think it's really important to show that people like us and like me have these different roles in the sports industry. So I took the time to make a Hispanic Heritage Month sports professionals thread. So every single day of Hispanic Heritage Month, I highlighted a different person. When I was doing this research, a lot of the lists were outdated. They were like from 2013. And I was like, okay, great. And they also had a lot of like, you know, ESPN uh, reporters or VPs or like senior directors. And I mean, those people are great and are amazing representation, but I was looking for like coordinators, managers, people that I felt like were accessible to people like me that wanted to learn about how to break into the sports industry. So from meeting two people to meeting three to meeting 10 more, once the month was over, I had met 30, 31 really incredible Latinas and Latinos. And I was like, wow, I feel so empowered and validated to want to be a Latina that works in the sports industry. I wish everybody else felt like this. And I don't think this is a conversation that should only last 30 days out of the year. And that was really where Latinx and sports was born. We had a couple of like brainstorming calls. I was obviously like one person came out of grad school didn't have a full-time job or anything. And there was a lot of people that were really supportive that already were in the industry for 10, 15 years. At the time, I didn't know what ERGs were. So I didn't even know that was like its own mini club that exists within an organization. But there were so many people on this brainstorming call that were supportive of our idea and what we wanted to do. And they're like, wow, like we wish we had this when we were growing up. Like, let's let's do it. Like you should like run with it. And I was like, okay, like if these there's these professionals that I look up to that say I should do it, well, then I guess I guess I got to do it now. Yeah, that's a pretty good motivator. Yeah. So that's really what it came out of. And all of the rest of 2020 and 2021, we did uh, virtual events. So we did like bi-monthly 
Zoom calls. So one was a networking call, one was a panel. So it was a lot of Zooms. We did our first in-person event at SoFi Stadium in March of 2022. So we did like an LA networking event, a happy hour. They got a tour of SoFi Stadium because one of our board members is currently there at SoFi Stadium. So he was very kind and was like, hey, like your first event, you're in LA, like let's do it. And I was like, for sure. Like we planned it, I think in like three weeks, which was very like usual for us because I feel like as a startup, nonprofit, still very young. A lot of the things that we do are very much like on the fly. So it just worked yep. out oh, yeah. really well. Um, so we did our first event there at SoFi. We did our second event with the Arizona Diamondbacks in August. And then our third event was in October. And we did it here at MLB before I actually got here. Or it was September. It was September. We did it here at MLB before I got here. Um, so we got to do all these different in-person events. And we also started integrating quarterly virtual events. There's people from LA to Mexico City to New York to Florida that joined these calls. And I think that's something that's really special. I was just talking about this actually last night with someone else at a networking happy hour that I went to. But, you know, like it's cool to provide the opportunity that you don't have to be in the same place to meet these people. So we do like, let's say there's 50 people. We do 10 groups of like five. So like, you know, we'll give them prompt questions and they can network with each other. Sometimes like the conversation goes like completely like a different way and like they're still getting to know one another, which is important. Um, But to be able to provide those opportunities while also having different target markets and in-person events is something that's really important for us. I mean, do you ever sit back and just feel appreciative of what you've accomplished and feel successful with this? Because this is the kind of thing that not a lot of people are able to take from an idea and actually execute in the fashion that you have. Do you ever sit back and and celebrate it? Yeah, I think... I, I definitely do. The SoFi event, I went with one of my coworkers because we were there for a U.S. soccer game or so, U.S. soccer summit um, there in March in L.A. And, you know, we're driving home and like I couldn't stop smiling. She was like, you've been smiling like the whole night. She's like, you've talked to every single person in that room. She's like, it's incredible to see what you were able to do and like what you were able to accomplish. because it was our first in-person event and to see it the actual people that I knew from over Zoom and now to see them in person and to see this whole event come together was something that was incredible for me. And last night I I was at this networking happy hour and, you know, people are like, hey, you're Alana, you're from Latinx and sports. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm recognizable. I was like, okay. (laughs) I was like, this is really cool. Um, So yeah, yeah, so I, I definitely- That's awesome. I definitely do think that I I am appreciative of the community that we've been able to grow. And without our community, you know, we we wouldn't have anything. I, you know, I'm super like acknowledgeable of that, that if, you know, there wasn't five people on our board that were super supportive and put our names in rooms that I, I've never even known of, then we wouldn't be where we are today. So I think it's it's insane and it's super cool. And we've had also so many success stories of like, hey, I met someone on your networking call and then I followed up and now I have a job at MLB. Hey, I did this. I followed up. Now I have an internship. I, you know, got volunteer experience. So just to know that we were able to help it's people working. make those connections. Yeah, it it's working. And I think at the end of the day, like that's that's all we could have ever asked for was to be. That's the motivation you need is to know that it's positively affecting people. Yeah. I think that's beautiful. I got into doing this show, the same kind of mentality of if we can help people on their journey, giving them a little bit more advice. And you get that little bit of feedback from somebody saying, I did the thing you told me to do and it worked. And that that means the world because you know that you're helping somebody. So for pe- for a lot of people listening, networking is hard. It's one of those things that people aren't always natural at or it feels uncomfortable for them. What what tips would you give them? Because you, you, it sounds like you're really, I mean, really good at this. What tips would you give people to feel more comfortable in that environment and to make sure that they're making a, a deepened relationship? Yeah, I think all it takes is, you know, one one message, one DM, one one LinkedIn message, anything. I think for me, the biggest advice that I've received and that I put forth is the authentic networking. When you send that message or you send that DM like, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so. I'm really interested in this part about your job. I would love to put some time in your calendar to discuss. I was actually just watching an Instagram story. This is totally off topic, but there's a girl from the Chicago Bears and she did a whole deep dive on how to best message people on LinkedIn. Some people like her in her in her Instagram story was like, hey, my name is so-and-so. I applied to this job. Like, can you please like put me in touch with the hiring manager? I would love to chat. Like two completely different nope. spectrums. Yeah, right. exactly. So, Wrong. Yeah. So I think there's no harm in doing that. But her point was that someone had reached out to her about like partnerships and she was in DEI. She was like, you could find someone in the partnerships department that would probably reply and would help you in that direction. But you need to it's to show like that you did your research and that you put in the effort yep. and took you the time. You put some thought into it. You were exactly. intentional about it. A hundred percent. I mean, I 
would have done the same thing. I'm pretty sure I did the same thing when I applied to jobs at U.S. Soccer before I, I landed my job. I, you know, if I, I applied to an events job, I actually got rejected from an events job and then ended up at Fan Experience Coordinator, which is my own success story of rejection in the sports industry. But, you know, it's it's about authentically reaching out to people because if someone talks to me in April and then in December, you're like, hey, I applied to an internship. Okay, great. I know you. I know that you were genuine, that you yep. just wanted to learn what I do at MLB or that you want to know about, you know, U.S. soccer. Like, I have people that reach out to me about the job that I had at U.S. soccer when they were applying. And I, I, I you know, I talked to them and they're like, hey, I'm really interested in applying. And I was like, for sure. I emailed my old manager. I was like, hey, I just spoke to so-and-so. Here's a resume. They're great. You know, like, it's just things like that mm-hmm. where you authentically meet with someone and you they really feel like you want to get to know them I think is what goes a really long way and I think that's also how I ended up here at MLB the people that I work with now I've known for like two or three years before I even got here and when I was thinking about applying they knew me already and they knew me as a person separate from my job or from me wanting to apply to a job and they knew me because of Latinx or because I reached out to them you know over LinkedIn and etc so I think one conversation six months down the road can lead to them recommending you for a job because they know who you are as a person before wanting to be in the sports industry. I think that's fantastic advice. And I totally agree in that you, it's more of a concept of relationship building and trying to really understand your goals in the conversation, what you want to learn and understanding that, you know, networking isn't about just a straight line to a job. There's a lot of benefits that can come from it, from mentorship, from advice, from, you know, bouncing ideas off of somebody that's that's maybe has a different experience level than you do. So networking can have a lot of ancillary benefits other than, oh, I know this person that can help me get a job. So there's just a lot of great, great things that can come from it if you go about it authentically. So I completely agree with you. Alana, this has been an amazing, amazing conversation. I want to finish up with this because I want to be respectful of your time. I mean, you work for Major League Baseball. You got to get back to work, I'm sure. So... Um, you aren't too far removed from being a college student yourself, but I'm sure you're reflective and you can look back and think of how you progressed to the point you are now. As you look back and knowing that a lot of college students listen to these episodes and try to get advice that they can put into their own lives, what kind of advice would you share with that that next generation coming up that you think might help them find their foothold in the sports industry? Yeah, I think one of them, obviously, the last question is definitely networking, you know, networking <laughs> but You know, for me, it's taking on those volunteer opportunities. Like I did a lot of volunteering, like with PR and communications at CONCACAF when Gold Cup came to Arizona. And I don't use it in my job now, but I got to meet those people. And I now understand what a communications team does at, you know, a game like at a soccer game, which I think also goes a really long way because you're able to see what your coworkers do on a day-to-day basis and are able to learn how all these different moving parts of a sports entity, a league, a sports business, anything like that kind of all come together for the success of a greater event or a greater business. And definitely like those informational interviews as well, just, you know, taking 10, 15 minutes of someone's time to just learn about what their day-to-day job is, whether you're in an organization and you want to learn about what a different department does, or you're in an organization and you want to learn about what a different organization does or a different team. I think those little conversations really help steer you in the right direction and really help educate you and and allow you to learn more about what goes on just outside of what you might know on your day-to-day. I love it. This has been incredibly great advice and, and, you know, I think we share, share a spirit child and that we both talk really fast because yeah. <laughs> we got a lot to say and we're passionate. We're excited. You, you just want to get it all out there, which I love. So you brought me up an energy level today and I really appreciate it, Alana. This was a great, great conversation. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I think my last message is, is if anybody listens to this and wants to network, uh, feel free to reach out because I'm always here to help. All right. Where's the best place for them to find you? Uh, LinkedIn, Alana Mraz. Twitter, Lonnie Mraz, but also Alana Mraz. Honestly, I've gotten Instagram messages from girls I want to network, and I've taken them, and I've helped on Zoom calls with them. So really, anywhere, any place. Anywhere. I'm, yeah. As long as it's You're me, available. You're yeah, out there. I'm, I'm definitely available and, and you know, willing to network and happy to network and, and be able to help however I can. Thank you to Alana for coming on the show. That was infectious. You feel that. You listen to her and you feel that energy and you're like, I want to be around this person. And that's what I'm trying to convey to all of you listening. Likeability matters. Energy, enthusiasm. When you go into an interview, make sure you convey that. Bring that with you. Don't hide that behind because that's how you convey to others that you're going to bring your all to the work environment and you're going to lift up a culture that people are drawn to, that you have that magnetism. That's where leadership starts, is with a little bit of likability. And then everything grows from there. 
Keep focused in that area and you'll become unstoppable as well. Thank you again, Alana. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you all next week.